Just like the fight between Betamax and VHS in the 1980s, there's been an ongoing fight in the EV world over whose charging standard is the best. It's been raging, in fact, for longer than you might think, with the last two decades seeing at least 15 different AC or DC charging standards around the world that I can think of, all designed to get power into, and sometimes out of, an EV. Some were little more than basic mechanical interconnects. Others were frankly a marvel of engineering, and some, like the AC inductive paddles favoured in early noughties were just so, so satisfying to use. Today, there are four dominant DC quick charging standards around the world. There's the Combined Charge Standard, or CCS for short, which comes in two different variants depending on where you live in the world. Then there's Chidemo, a standard which has pretty much become specific to Japan and Japanese-made EVs. Then there's the GB-T standard, as used in China. And finally, the small, svelte Tesla charging connector, as found on all of Tesla's North American in-production vehicles, and all of Tesla's North American superchargers. Officially, North America and Korea have adopted the CCS Type 1 as their DC quick charging standard of choice. Europe has adopted CCS Type 2 as theirs, along with Australia and New Zealand. The choice of those official standards was made by the European Automobile Manufacturers Association, the ACEA, and the Society of Automotive Engineers, or SAE for short, with the latter responsible for defining exactly how CCS Type 1 and Type 2 should work and how automakers should implement those standards in their vehicles. And with only two exceptions, the Nissan Leaf, which still uses Chidemo on account of being made by a Japanese automaker, and Tesla, which uses its own charge port, every new electric car sold in North America today complies with the CCS charging standard. Because that's the standard. Except one startup, Aptera Motors, wants to change that. It's actively petitioning the US government to forget about a standard that's existed for more than a decade and instead force automakers and the industry to use Tesla's charging standard. And you guys, gals, and non-binary folks have requested a lot that we cover this on the channel, especially after I foolishly said recently on a show that I don't support the petition. So I should probably explain. Buckle in, because this is going to get bumpy. And it's going to be quite a long video too. Sorry. Aptera, the solar electric vehicle company that's promising to revolutionise the EV world with its ultra-efficient wingless, not quite an airplane trike, is no stranger to challenging the status quo. It's why its vehicle designs are unlike anything we've seen before. Its attitude to the right to repair movement is so far an amazingly positive one. And its goal all along has not been to replace the automobile, but to offer something that is uniquely suited to being an alternative to driving around in multi-ton metal boxes. Something so efficient, in fact, that it's pretty much a no-brainer to want to own one which is, side note, the reason why I put down a deposit to own one. That's my disclaimer. And in case you're interested, my car, according to current estimates, is due sometime in 2024 or thereabouts if I decide to move forward with a confirmed order. Part of Aptera's USP is that its vehicle design is so aerodynamic that it uses far less energy to push itself all along. It's all about energy efficiency. So it's no surprise that ever since the reborn Aptera was unveiled a few years ago, it has used a Tesla charging inlet as its preferred charge connector of choice. And there is a very, very good set of reasons why that is. Tesla's charging inlet combines both slow and quick charging connections in one physical plug. In fact, it uses the same physical pins to transfer AC power from a domestic charging station to the vehicle and DC power from a supercharger with internal electronics inside every Tesla, switching relays to divert power either to the car's onboard AC charger or directly to the battery pack. That 
clever bit of engineering in each Tesla results in a connector that is smaller than any other AC or DC charging connector on the market today. For Aptera, that is incredibly important because it means it can hide the charging inlet behind the rear license plate rather than put it on the side of the vehicle where any disruption to airflow would ultimately result in a negative impact to the car's claimed 10 miles per kilowatt hour efficiency. And let's face it, unlike your average EV out there where the charge door can be located on a fairly flat piece of bodywork, there are really not that many flat parts on the Aptera body design where a side mounted CCS inlet would easily be fitted. At this point then, you would think I'd probably be okay with Aptera using a Tesla standard for its vehicles. And you'd be right, I am. If it works for Aptera, that is truly awesome. And I, as a hopeful future Aptera owner, have no problem using Tesla's standard. And if Tesla and Aptera came to an agreement over supercharger use, although that may not be required if Tesla opens up its North American supercharger network to non-Teslas, then again, I would be happy to use the supercharger network. It's fast, reliable, and the experience is pretty streamlined. And because Aptera's battery packs are going to be relatively small compared to most modern EVs out there, they don't really require the 800 volt rapid charging capabilities that larger vehicles are starting to adopt, charging levels that Tesla's supercharger network currently does not support. However, there are some hurdles for Aptera using Tesla's proprietary connector, and we should revisit those before going further, because it revolves around the legalese that accompanies Tesla's now famous All Our Patents Are Belong To You post of 2014. When Tesla said it would open up its patents for other automakers to use, many in the EV world wondered why other automakers didn't take Tesla up on its offer. Some even accused legacy automakers of dismissing Tesla's generous offer in an attempt to stop EVs becoming mainstream. But the reality of Tesla's patent agreement was that in order to take up Tesla on its offer of using its EV patents in rival vehicles, rival firms had to not only agree to never sue Tesla for patent infringement for its own patents, but to agree to not sue other companies for infringing on EV patents. That agreement also extended not just to the automaker in question, but all of its part suppliers as well. Finally, the agreement also required that said companies did not oppose Tesla's existing or future patents or indeed copy Tesla's designs. And all of that is wonderful and good and noble in an ideal world where nothing ever goes wrong. But it also gave Tesla a huge advantage over the competition in the EV industry. This, by the way, is before an automaker came to an agreement with Tesla on its supercharger network, for which Tesla would, at the time, expect some kind of recompense from said company to compensate it for the costs associated with the maintenance and upkeep of the supercharger network. Although I'm not sure if that would still stand today, as Tesla now generally charges its customers for using the supercharger network, which is something it initially didn't do. With that history lesson out of the way and me stating I'd be totally okay with Aptera using Tesla's charging standards, you'd think that I may be pro Tesla charging standard becoming the de facto charging standard in North America, which is what Aptera's petition is seeking to do. Except I'm not. One automaker choosing voluntarily to adopt a non-standard connector is down to that automaker and its customers. But trying to require that a widely adopted standard is changed? That's frankly something else. And that's the thing I'm not happy about. It's down to both technical differences between the two standards, as well as the massive investment that's already been made in establishing CCS as a global standard. As I alluded to at the start of this video, the CCS standard, agreed on in late 2011 and first demonstrated in early 2012, just ahead of Tesla's Model S rolling off the production line for the first time, was established through mutual agreement between the majority of US and European automakers. 
And look, let's be honest, the standard isn't the most aesthetically pleasing design out there. To establish CCS1 and CCS2, engineers basically took the already existing J1772 charge standard as used in North America and the Type 2 charging standard used in Europe and then just added two massive DC power pins at the bottom. Tesla's solution, meanwhile, to combine AC and DC pins and rely on internal relay switching is far more elegant from the user's perspective. However, the CCS standard allowed automakers to ensure backward compatibility with existing J1772 and Type 2 AC charging stations. And at the time, it was a big deal because while EV charging stations are still few and far between, there were still significant numbers of J1772 charging stations and Type 2 charging stations being deployed around the world from 2009 onwards. Moreover, the CCS charge standard allowed for physically different cabling and pins for DC power, so the DC power pins were oversized and overspecced for high current transfer. And in the world of electronics, the larger a physical connector is and the larger its physical area of contact between plug and socket, the less likely it is to overheat or in fact require additional cooling. Moreover, while Tesla's current supercharger standard doesn't accommodate 800 volt DC quick charging as CCS does, allowing higher voltage cars to charge incredibly rapidly on the road, CCS also accommodates V to G. At least we are starting to see V to G and V to H appliances roll out for CCS vehicles. That's something Tesla doesn't support. And Elon Musk has been pretty vocal in the past about not liking vehicle-to-grid technology. However, as studies have shown time and time again, two-way power transfer between EVs and home or the electrical grid can not only increase the life of a battery, but dramatically reduce demand on the electrical grid without requiring every person to have an expensive, dedicated home backup battery system. These two technical features are being overlooked by many who either see V to G as not necessary or who feel that the benefits of a physically smaller connector outweigh the disadvantages. And look, I have to agree, Tesla's supercharger connector is far easier to handle and use, and it's better suited to those who have mobility problems. But the solution, I fear, isn't to throw out the metaphorical baby with the bathwater but instead to work to design better charging stations with more accessible features, such as an insurance that every charging station has a dedicated strain release cable to take up the heavy weight of the connector away from the end user. Of course, there are many who say that Tesla's connector is more reliable than CCS, and I feel that is conflating the user experience of a Tesla supercharger versus the user experience at a non-dedicated CCS network with a physical plug design. While there are physical challenges to the CCS standard, mostly relating to how different automakers and charging manufacturers build their units based off their own interpretation of what the CCS standard is, Tesla's network just works because Tesla controls the entire aspect of the user experience, from the vehicle design to the charging station design to the payment system and power delivery. And Tesla therefore can react more quickly to any issues that crop up because it controls the entire process. So of course, its charging experience is going to be better than a CCS car from one of tens of manufacturers sourcing connectors from a dozen different suppliers, connecting to different charging stations from different manufacturers and charging networks. I suspect if one company or one organization were responsible for CCS implementation, you would have a Tesla supercharger-like experience with CCS-compatible cars. And you can see this in other industries. If you've got an Apple iPhone, you'll know that if you use Apple branded charging cables and adapters, you rarely will have an issue. But as soon as you even consider using a third party cable, even one that's been verified for use on an Apple device, you're more likely to run into issues. 
And it's the same thing with EV charging. But you need to ask yourself at this point if you're happy with Tesla becoming the monopoly on charging if you want to have that same seamless experience with every EV. And to be honest, you probably wouldn't have that experience in non-Tesla EVs because each programming team at each automaker would interpret and implement Tesla's charging standard slightly differently. And maybe you also need to ask yourself if you'd rather regulators begin to work with the EV industry to mandate one charging standard for all, enforcing stricter compliance and finding providers who don't play ball. That is essentially what we are now seeing in Europe, and Europe mandates that all EVs use CCS as their chosen rapid charging standard. It has for several years. And we've seen not only Tesla use CCS as its preferred charging standard in Europe, but also Tesla open its superchargers to non-Teslas, which frankly I think is a double win for Tesla as it means more money from its charging network. Which brings me to my final point. The entire point of standardization. As a standard, CCS is not the best, let's be honest. But it is a standard that has been established now for more than a decade. Every new EV made now, with the exceptions I outlined earlier, uses CCS as its charge standard. Moreover, CCS was designed to be backwards compatible, meaning older CCS equipped cars can still use CCS 800 volt charging stations. They just charge at a lower rate because their pinouts are the same. And while Tesla certainly has the larger user base in terms of vehicles with Tesla charging inlets in North America, and it has more physical supercharger stalls than either CCS or Chademo, it has, according to the US Department of Energy's Alternative Fuels Data Center, just shy of 1,600 supercharger sites throughout the US and Canada, each site, of course, having multiple supercharger stations. That same database, meanwhile, says there are 5,758 locations throughout North America with CCS compatible charging stations. Not all of those locations will have multiple dispensers like Tesla does, but nevertheless, that is not an insignificant number and shouldn't be sniffed at. Those charging stations represent millions, no, billions of dollars of infrastructure investment which will all be required to change should Tesla's charging standard be adopted to replace CCS. And it would not just affect big charging networks like Electrify America or EVgo, who could probably afford to change, but also the thousands of independent garages, stores and dealerships who chose to install the infrastructure themselves, making an investment that many of them may still be paying off. And that's before you even consider the hundreds of thousands of CCS compatible EVs already in use in North America. Sure, Tesla does dominate the market with the massive lion's share of more than 2 million EVs now on the roads of North America being Teslas. But that doesn't take into consideration the hundreds of thousands of other EVs that are not Teslas now in active use. Forcing a standard change at this point in history would not only dissuade customers from going electric, because let's be honest, nobody wants to own something that is not compatible with the latest standard, but it would actively make it harder for those existing models on the roads today to enjoy a long and useful life on the used car market. If you are skeptical about that last fact, just look at the decline in sales of the Nissan Leaf, a car that is still perfectly acceptable for most suburban and mid-range trips, but is becoming a massive pill to travel long distance in because pretty much every major rapid charging network in the US offers just one Chidemo charging station per location, which increases the likelihood you're gonna be stranded on the road if something goes wrong. Ah, but what about Tesla, I hear you ask? Tesla does just fine on its own standard. And you'd be right, it does. 
But in addition to controlling the entire user experience, Tesla subsidizes its charging network through its vehicle sales. A significant portion of your brand new Model S, 3, X or Y goes towards helping pay for supercharger network upkeep. And let's be honest, Tesla's network isn't set up as a money maker as it is with other networks. But Tesla made a conscious choice to not follow the CCS standard and only to adopt it in Europe under duress. And that is a very different proposition to an automaker demanding that everybody in the industry drops an existing functional standard just because the alternative is smaller, more compact, <sighs> and a hell of a lot more sexy. So there you have it in a rather large nutshell. If Tesla and Aptera can agree on the Tesla supercharger standard, I'm all for Aptera using Tesla's supercharger standard. But let's not conflate that with CCS being terrible and requiring every other automaker follow suit. That would not only bankrupt some charging providers and render some charging stations unusable forevermore, but it would set back the drive to electrification decades, especially in the used car market, where I'd argue we need every car that exists on the road today to stay on the road for many, many years to come. That's it for today. If you did like the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send our way does go towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, please make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolved Take Two, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire crew goes out to everyone who makes this channel possible. And that includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who watch, share, and interact every video. If you are a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name right here on my right. And if you've just joined and your name isn't showing, don't worry. We currently render the list every week or so, and sometimes our videos are produced a few days or weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Chris Maxwell, Pedro Mopinjero, Patrick Boyarski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, Dave Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leon, Andrew Martin, Gita Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tesla in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Dan Bear, Jim Burness, Chris Asenta, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And of course, super out of this world thanks to our Starman tier supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Redar, JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Kevin Burrowbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. If you'd like to be part of that amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below. You can hit the join button to support us on YouTube or show us your support through Bitcoin, Ko-fi, or buying something from our cool swag store. And if you are unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it really does make a difference to our overall revenue. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you soon. And as always, Keep evolving!